And this is a run through. This is really, I mean, this is hot off the press. So what you're about to learn, nobody else has learned so far. Um, yeah, and we're going to teach this at the actual CELA conference in two weeks from today. And so this is, uh, it, we're going to cut it tight. It really will probably take the whole time to, to get through everything that we want to show you how to do and to give you the prelimin preliminary information that we feel like we need to share. Um, there's a few of you I know who don't work in Latin America and will not ever put their materials into, uh, into ILA probably. Um, and so I'm sorry for you who are being forced to participate, but this could be useful for you in other ways because eventually you will be curating your own digital collection to put in some other archive or digital repository during your career. So um, with that said, I'm going to pass the floor to Ryan, who is going to take us through the introductory material. All right. So y'all should have already <coughs> downloaded or received from the USB drive that's being passed around. Right. So within this directory, you will, you will find a readme file in case you decide to revisit these materials later, a metadata spreadsheet, and a folder called Map Navigation Pilot, or something very similar to that. And inside that, they'll find a bunch of media. This will be the media that we'll be adding to the repository uh, or to the archive today as the course moves on. And this metadata sheet, so this metadata sheet, thanks, Mark. So this metadata sheet is what we'll be using to fill out the information um, onto the records in the archive that we'll be making. Notice that it has a number of tabs on it. The first one that shows up will be uh, information about the collection. Since um, most researchers will only ever be dealing with adding materials to one collection at a time, this you'll probably only ever encounter one row here. Next up will be resources, where the information about, about that will be pertaining to a set of media files will be listed there. The next tab is the information about the media files themselves. Then we have information about the languages that are that are present, as well as the contributors to the to the research. And at the at the back end of it all, we have a list of controlled vocabulary. Should you want to um, choose between the um, these the sets of words that we have available for certain certain features like um, certain metadata fields like genre. So now that we've we've gotten we're we're sure that everyone's got got the, got all that. Let's talk a bit about what an ILA is. ILA is a, a website. It's a digital special collection. We have space on a server. We don't really have books on shelves. And our, our files are multimedia materials <laughs> in and about the indigenous languages of Latin America. So from Tierra del Fuego up to Rio Bravo and actually a little bit beyond. And another feature about ILA is that it has parallel interfaces. So when you go to the visit the site, you'll probably I'll initially land on the English version of the page, but there's a button in the upper right to switch to a Spanish view. And you'll notice if you page between these that there are certain fields which only will appear in English and others which will only appear in Spanish. So having a so that is what we mean when we say that we have a multilingual multilingual metadata, some material that's only in Spanish and some that's only in English, and we have other fields which are which will automatically generate the particular languages version, and there's also the possibility for titles and descriptions of resources and collections to have a third language be present. Uh, we intend this for, to be the to be an indigenous language, which is important for your collection if you're able to provide one. So you're more than well, very happy to take those titles as well. So everybody's got the got the uh, instructional media. Um, all right. So all right, we've been using a couple words here: um, collection, resource, and media file. These are the three levels of organization that are pertinent for, for uh, ILA's um, digital repository. And actually, uh, very similar concepts are present at most uh, digital archives, be they language archives or not. So a collection is a, 
is a big collection is a grouping together of a number of resources which are then themselves groups of related media files. From the point of view of a language documenter or a language describer, the most common grouping together of resources will be grouping together things that all stem from a single linguistic event. So a so a linguistic act is done, it is recorded in by audio, video, or, or, or being written down, and then from there you might produce uh, audio, trans might produce transcriptions and translations of, the, of, the, of, the, um, of, of that bit of speech or signing. You might get um, photographs related to the event that's taking place, and you might have other kinds of analyses that you derive later. All of those get, get grouped together. Some different archives call these things bundles. Some call them um, sessions, especially going, really thinking of a this, of, of these things as all being related to a single act of recording language. But there are other ways of grouping things together. Depending on what kind of material you have, you might want to think about organizing your materials in a different way. Say, for example, if you're doing a, a multi-site um, language survey, it might make more sense, and if you're doing a particularly long one, like, you know, if you have a 1500 item lexical questionnaire, it's probably a nice thing for both you and your responder to break that up over a period of time. And so you might want to then group together all these recordings that, are ha that happened on different days in different places, perhaps, and have them all in one single site, because there's a unified protocol or, or, or organizing principle. Uh, similarly, if you're doing any kind of... Um, say you're doing acoustic experimental work, it might make sense to have all the recordings pertaining to a particular um, investigation be, be grouped together, even if they are, you know, the same words in carrier sentences said by multiple different people who may or may not even be in, in, in the same area at the, at the time of recording or even um, different uh, languages and such. A third potential way to organize to organize things would actually be selecting them from a bigger body of work. Um, we've seen examples of this where people would look through their recorded their recorded work and pull out all the um, bits of data that they have that relate to toponyms or relate to particular semantic domains. If you want to pull, if you are, you know, if it's in, if it's germane to your collection, you might want to to highlight. These are the words that deal with domestic plants and animals in this in this language. Or um, perhaps even more relevant, it might be to say, here are all the all the examples of a particular grammatical category, a particular inflectional paradigm, which is relevant to you know say a particular facet of your own research. It might be a chapter in your dissertation, so it might be uh, might be reason to group all this together so that someone can easily consult that. So. Three levels here: a collection of which will, you'll probably only have to worry about one, a resource which you can, you can have quite a number of, and media files which are going to be inside those resources. So you can think of the resources as folders containing files. Yep, you have a box. That's your collection. You've got a number of folders, and other things get put inside, and other things get put inside those <coughs> folders. So if we look at a collection, one example would be say. The linked collection, which is uh, Aviva Shemelman's collection of Yayo's Quechua. So we see that title, we have a title at the top, it presented in English and Spanish. We have a card of the descriptive metadata for the collection, along with a um, nice sized description. And then at the, below that, we have the folders. So these are the resources, each of which contains other information and, uh, and the files themselves. <coughs> So if we navigate to one of these, such as um, Kakra MB Life History, we see again a very similar looking page, titles at the top, a box of, box of descriptive metadata, but different kinds of metadata since resources have um, different, different uh, requirements. And below we have a list of files. So this particular resource has a MPG video file, a wave audio file and an EAF file, which, um, as language documenters, you are familiar this, with this and know this is a transcription file. We can actually then, you know, go and, and click on one of these files to get to get to the page of the file itself. 
and if you are and if you are logged in and have the appropriate permissions and are not looking at a restricted um, file below the metadata card you will actually see a player where you can stream a video file or an audio file or view an image file like a JPEG or or um, or a PDF or a PDF document and then of course download the files and a little pro tip for navigating Isla at above the titles you're going to see this list of this little chain of different linked things um, this these are your breadcrumbs or if you will they're your um, they're your, your your path back out of the of the deep depths of a collection down at the file level to jump back up to the resource or jump back up to the collection or back up to the entire list of collections that, that are available at Isla. And it's kind of key, like that's, we're, we're showing you this because this is kind of a crucial lifeline because there will be moments where you have no idea where you are and if you look at your breadcrumbs, you'll find your way out again. Mm -hmm. Especially as you're creating new resources that don't have items within them. It can be, you kind of don't have one of those visual cues about what level of the repository you're looking at. So, chances are all of y'all already have a collection of data, um, or you will soon be creating one. You could, you'll be creating it as you go through about go go through your your research days, collecting and analyzing analyzing materials. But those kinds of collections that you're going to have on your laptops and on your network drives are different from the kinds of collections that archives require and demand. The biggest difference is that an archive requires materials to be static and exist in some kind of persistent permanent way whereas your own materials are are dynamic you can do whatever you want to them you can delete you can delete the files off of your directory you can update things and replace them with a newer version um, you can have whatever file you want on a drive that you own and um, you and it, you don't need to worry about how it's organized because you put it there not that long ago, so you know how what everything is supposed to be. Every single one of those points is different for an archival collection. Uh, in in general, you're for any archive, not just ILO, you're not going to be able to delete files. Many archives will not allow you to version uh, different up, updates of of, diff, of files, so you can't uh, update something by replacing it. And um, you will most likely run into li limitations <coughs> according to media formats, <coughs> and sizes, and numbers of files. And <coughs> often not required, it's important to bear in mind that you, your collection should be organized and also, more importantly, documented and explained, described, for people who are going to be unfamiliar with you, who won't know why you went to such and such a place and recorded these people doing who knows what. Like those kinds of high level descriptions and orientations will be very useful for anyone who comes by later to use your materials. Call it the context. The context. Yeah. So what we'd recommend for people who are starting out with with a data collection like, like y'all is that uh, y'all follow what we can call progressive archiving. So essentially this is thinking of archiving as an iterative process and not a single thing that's done as, you know, as the crossing the finish line of your research uh, trajectory. So you'll be first upload, you'll be first uh, archiving those immutable parts of your data, the primary data collection that you do. And then you'll be adding two things, as adding things as they are finalized into, into your archive. And this has a couple advantages. It, one, it breaks up the tasks of archiving and spreads it out over time, so you're not faced with, a, you know, a graduation deadline or, God forbid, a a tenure and promotion uh, portfolio app completion deadline, and suddenly realize that you've got a lot of work to do to get your materials in order to be archived. And additionally, it also means that you're going to be working with your materials much closer to when they're they've been collected and when they've been created. At the point of archiving, so you're going to have a lot more of, of of head notes about what's involved with each of these files. The context will be fresher for you. Um, head it, notes. Yes, 
head notes. So information, <laughs> head notes. information that things that you know about your materials that you that are only live here. that only live in your head. You never write them down <laughs> because you know what they are and they make perfect sense to you. Um, um, you might not have had the experience of looking back and wondering why you why you made a file in one of your directories. I assure you it will come one day. <laughs> one day soon. <laughs> Probably soon. But um, yes, it, it's mystifying to ask, to, to think, why did I record this person counting to 10? I already had these numbers. Why would I be, what was I trying to do? But if if you do the if you do this these kinds of steps earlier and these the documentation closer to the point of creation you're not going to you're going to have the opportunity to capture more of that so example progressive archive and imagine that we're on a we're some uh, linguistic anthropologists who are studying the ethnomedicine practices of a particular community we go we go to we go to the community we conduct some interviews with people and we after our, our field trip, we go ahead and archive the video and the photos and the audio from that, rec from, that, um, from that event. Those things aren't going to change. The photograph isn't going to be edited in any significant way later. We're not going to realize that there was a mistake in the photograph. And similarly, the audio and the video, it might be edited or modified later, but the, the core data is still going to be there. And then, you know, we do more field trips, we visit the community again, we work remotely with some language <laughs> assistants to get some of our materials transcribed, and then we go ahead and start filling in the resources we've already made with our additional now with our additional derived products. Um, most commonly for, for language documenters, this will be things like transcriptions and translations. But you can also imagine like, you know, the results of a you know, a brief little acoustic study that you know you're um, charting out different speakers' vowel spaces, for example, could be added to another resource, potentially. Maybe you added subtitles or closed captions to your video or something. Yes. Yes, the, uh, the, sub the subtitles or a <laughs> subtitled version of the video could then also be added. And this process will then happen iteratively over the course of the research. So, you know, after our, our transcriptions, so, you know, six more months of work with our consultants, and we've got translations of our of our interviews now. And then we've also are now in a point where we can synthesize synthesize information from a number of different resources and create a, a new resource, say, a journal article summarizing uh, summarizing what we what our findings are. Um, for language documenters, you know, you'll be adding resources as you do your research. That will be your lexicon, your um, your grammatical sketches will be other new re new resources that you'll be adding, and of course those resources will have the most likely a PDF of the article or a text file of the article as a as a file. Now, before I turn it back over to Susan to talk about the, the the actual steps of how you'll go about digital brick by digital brick building your collection, let's have some more high level talk about what you'd have to do to become an ILA depositor and to use ILA self-depositing tools in the future. First off, if you don't, if you haven't already, you'll need to create an account and you'll have to agree to ILA's conditions for use of archive resources. This is a pretty common agreement. Essentially, uh, you agree to um, cite the resources you use to not use materials in the archive for commercial purposes, and also to um, respect the creators of those materials and the people in them. And the people in them. Uh, you'll also sign and complete a depositor license agreement form, just you know, entering into an agreement with us about about through the stewardship of your materials. You'll have to put in write an additional form that's a self-depositing agreement. It's really probably just going to be a signature. No, and no, it's going to be very detailed well, it's and not, binding. <laughs> it's just well, not written yet. That's why there's not, no link not, here. Not <laughs> I, I wanted to, to not give them the impression that they will be doing their taxes okay, with no. the amount of it's forms that we're talking about here. It's a postcard, not a tax code. These will be, <laughs> these will be, these will be things you'll be agreeing to, not large forms to fill out. And 
we've got all that in place, you can then give us a some a metadata spreadsheet with some information about things like your collection itself, the languages that are represented in it, and the contributors. And Isla staff are going to then upgrade your, your accounts to a depositor status, which will enable you to actually make changes to your collection, and we'll be creating some of these digital objects. So you're not going to be able to create your own collection, and you also are not going to be able to directly manage these four kinds of things. So, and that's be because these kinds of these kinds of uh, things can be associated with m more than one collection. So they have to be be uh, be reserved a bit. So languages exist as as digital objects as well as countries, um, as and persons who are going to be the contributors to the research, both as researchers and as research participants and other possible roles. And um, organizations. So if you're a part of a research team that that is depositing their materials in Isla as a team, you can potentially have this kind of entity as your in your collection. So we already so Ryan did a um, a very thorough job of kind of setting you up for how you become a self-depositor. And now I'm going to start by saying, no, 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 you can't do this. And I'm sorry to start with no's. Um, but you cannot create a new collection. We will create the collection for you. You cannot create or edit the person records, as we mentioned before. Some person records actually cross go um, are, occur in more than one collection because some people um, end up being participants in more than one researcher's research. Um, and also the person records contain a certain level of personal information that we don't want avail made available to the general public. Um, you cannot create or edit organizations for the same reasons as persons. Um, you will not be able to create or edit language or country records. And this is because we have to follow um, authority lists. So all archives and libraries follow some sort of authority list so that your data always points to an authority list and then you can therefore keep it very consistent kind of across the whole archive. Um, and so we are following authority lists for both languages and countries. You will not be able to delete objects. So this is really, really important and I think it's something that a lot of people don't understand when they first decide they're going to put their material into an archive. We do not delete. There's a long process of preservation and backup that we have to do. So even if we deleted your you know, one file from the repository itself, the online repository, that file still exists in multiple backups in multiple places, and it's just going to be impossible to go and delete it from all of those different backups. Therefore, um, please don't put anything in the repository that shouldn't go into the repository. So you really need to think about every single thing that you're putting into the repository, and that means looking at every one of your photographs. Um, if the photograph is not relevant, don't put it in the archive. I know that there are a lot of cute kittens in Mexico, but they do not, those photographs do not go in the archive. Um, also, you will not be able to move media objects between the resources. So if you get into a situation where you realize you've added the wrong media files to a particular resource, you need to let us know, and we can see about moving those media files and then making sure they get backed up properly. And that's the major reason why we can't let you move media files yourself, because then we don't know that we need to re-back up those media files in the proper place. So here's what you can do. Once we've created your collection, you can edit the metadata. And on the Schimmelman, I, I had my back to the screen, you showed them the Schimmelman collection, right? And it had this really long, nice description. So she did have the benefit of writing that in hindsight. So she had already come back from the field and wrote that nice long description. But that description is something that you can start as soon as you're back from the field or even while you're in the field, and then you can always add to it. And you can change it. And if you got something you know, slightly incorrect in the description, then by all means go in and edit the description. Or uh, maybe you've got a website that you want to add to your collection information or something like that. The other things you'll be able to do are create and edit your own resources. Those are the folders that contain the media files. And so you will be able to add those, and then you'll be able to go in and edit the metadata that's showing up. 
you'll be able to add your own media files, but there are some restrictions. So the, the interface that we're going to use says that it allows media files up to two gigabytes, but we've discovered that it, the connection actually times out for anything larger than about a gigabyte. So you will need to limit your file size to a gigabyte or less. Um, and we only allow certain formats to be ingested into the archive, and those are listed on the forms themselves. You will be able to create and edit the metadata that's attached to each file, each media file, and you will also be able to edit the access levels. So when you use the forms, the access level is automatically set to public access, and you can go in and change that if you think that's necessary. Okay, so we've got the, um, all of the practice material already, so now we're going to start becoming very interactive. Please open the spreadsheet if you haven't already that was in the folder of materials that you downloaded. Feel free to use my computer. <coughs> Oh, I don't have my my notes here. Okay, Ryan already explained the metadata sheet, um, but notice that there is color blocking, and the color blocking represents the actual blocking on the form. So that's just a little bit of um, advice when it comes time to take some of the information from the spreadsheet and put it into the form itself. Now, let me see if I can go back to the notes, to the slides. Where were we on here? Yeah. Okay, so if you would, go ahead and um, log into the Islandor QA site with the orange card that you were given. That's going to be your <coughs> username. Well, everybody has the same username and password, but you've also been assigned a collection to work in. We have several <laughs> demo collections set up. <coughs> Um, yes, we're in the QA. Is anybody having trouble getting to the QA site? So the login that everyone is using today is Archivathon, and the password is Isla. So go ahead and log in once you get to the site. And once you're logged in, you'll notice up here in the upper left corner it says Collections. So click on the Collections tab. I think I'm not clicking hard enough. This is not my computer. There we go. No. It's not, not is responding. Is it slow because we're all using it at once? Did yours eventually come up? I can probably use the back button and get back there faster. So while we're waiting for uh, everybody to get connected, I'll kind of point out some other um, features. So if you have forgotten your password, underneath the login area, there's a place where you can request a new password. But please do not do that with this temporary username <laughs> that we've given you, since everybody's using the same one. It's important that uh, we not get into a situation where nobody can log in because somebody requested a new password. Okay, so each one of you was assigned an Archivathon demo folder, and it's on your card. And so navigate to your Archivathon demo folder, please. Is everybody there? Mm -hmm. Okay, now the first thing that you're going to do, and oh, I don't know what number I'm working on. What number should I work in, Ryan? What's our next card? Is, uh, no, sorry, 25. 25 is free. Okay. Or 13. Or 13. I'm going to take 13 because today is Friday the 13th. 
So if that's symbolic, I was born on a Friday the 13th, so today is my day. Oh, you're destined to work in the <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the uh, notice here that we have no metadata entered beyond the title, and we're working on the English side. We didn't even point out the Spanish English feature, which is at the very top right. You'll notice there's a button that says Spanish and English. Today, we're only working on the English side. Next, well, not next Friday, but in two weeks, we'll be working only on the Spanish side. So if you want to hear this again in Spanish, in bad Spanish, come back then. Um, so to begin to edit this material, <laughs> the first thing you want to do is find these two tabs, View and Manage. These are your lifelines along with the breadcrumbs. So click on Manage and you will see a new menu choice here. You can add an object to this collection. We're not going to do that yet, so hold off. We'll, what we want to do is edit the metadata, so click on Data Streams, and then scroll down. You'll see this grid, and in the very first column, come down to Mods, and then go all the way over to the right to Edit, and click on that. And now, to edit the collections, please, for the titles, just add your name to the end of the title in English and in Spanish. We don't want to actually change the Archivathon um, name because we want this to be in alphabetical order so that we can quickly clean this up and use it again in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So underneath the English title and the Spanish title, we have a title where you can put an indigenous language. Now on the spreadsheet, we actually filled out some information that you can use to just drop into everything that we're going to do today. So if you go over to your spreadsheet to the collection tab, um, you'll see that column A is the collection title in English, column B is the collection title in Spanish, column C is the collection title in Tatalpec Chichino. Guess who made this metadata for us? Copy that, and you can put that right into. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Who's confused? What do you want us to take? <laughs> Help to just name okay. the cell. Okay. The cell is C, title. the indigenous title, C. C4. Okay. It's like playing Battleship. Okay. Oh, the indigenous yeah, title. Yeah. Yes, the, the indigenous the title. Spreadsheet opened up originally on the resources tab. Yeah. You need to click over to the Yes, collections. click over to collections. <laughs> <laughs> so it, there needs to be like a PFSX file that goes in with the spreadsheet so that the spreadsheet always opens like <laughs> you can force it to open where you want it to open I even went to the spreadsheet and I put I put the spreadsheet in column A of collections before I you know copied it onto the USB and it still showed up in collections I'm sorry <laughs> I was trying to avoid that so okay are we all on the same page now yeah okay so I'm gonna navigate back over now the title field is a free text field. So you can type anything you want into a free text field. But the field underneath it, in the white box, that says language. Yeah. So maybe I need to take my screen a little bit higher so that you guys can see where I'm talking about. So we just entered a title here, an indigenous title. And then under that, we need to specify what language that title is in, because search engines are going to be searching the web. All of our other language fields are labeled behind the scenes with either English or Spanish, but we have to forcefully enter the language here. But notice this little circle. This little circle means that this is an auto-suggest field. There are hundreds of languages in this database, so you have to suggest slowly. So you start typing Chatino, and you see what comes up. And you look in your list, and you see if you can find Tataltepec, and it's Tataltepec de Valdez. And we select that, and notice that it saved the language code here. That's what's displaying in this form. I don't know why it's displaying that in the form. It's just how it got programmed.
Okay, we're going to skip the website and we're going to come down to, okay, well, let me show you what we're skipping. If you had a website associated with your project, then you could enter it here. Susan, is the abbreviation of the language name related to the um, code of yes. the language? It is yes, the code. it is it's the code. ISO. Yes, ISO. yes, that's our authority list. We use the ISO 639, yes. Good question. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to make the search engine search just for the code. So if you knew your code and you just typed your code in here, the auto-suggest wouldn't work. So you have to start typing the language name. These auto-suggest fields are very sensitive. And if you type really fast, faster than it can auto-suggest, and don't give it the opportunity to auto-suggest something, it will not actually save what you typed into that field. Mm -hmm. So it's important that if you see this auto-suggest field that you actually pick an auto-suggested option. All right, so you have the um, place that where you can put the website, which we're not going to do right now. And instead, we're going to come down to the collector in um, field. And I want you to notice the tab at the top that says one in this add button. So this add button, you will only push it if you need to add a second collector. So it will save the first name automatically. But if you want to add a second one, that's when you push the add button. So if you go back over to your spreadsheet and stay in that same tab, we're not going to leave the collection tab for a while, and scroll to the right. Let's see if I can get it to scroll to the right. Whoops. We'll come up into the blue area where it says collector name one and collector name two. So we see we have two collectors, so we're going to have to fill in two names in the form. And these forms are called web forms, by the way. So again, this is an auto-suggest field, so you need to type sort of slowly. We're looking for Mark Sicoli. Fortunately, he's the only Sicoli in the whole database, so he's very easy to find, but when you get a Pedro Martinez, that's going to be really hard. Um, so I added Mark. I waited, well, I started typing, I waited for his name to come up, and then I clicked on, I hit enter. So his name is now saved. And you can tell because there is an ILAPID here, okay? Mm -hmm. So these ILAPIDs are very powerful things. And once an ILAPID is assigned, it's assigned forever. And it never gets used for anything else. PID, persistent Persist identifier. Yeah, persistent identifier, yes. <laughs> A person identifier, except that they show up for more than just people. So please click the Add button and notice that you get a second tab up here at the top after you click the Add button. Yeah, and now you need to actually click on that second tab. And when you click on the two, another name field appears. And we had a second name on that spreadsheet. Does anybody remember what it was? Ryan Sullivan. Good. So slowly start to type Sullivan, and we've got two auto-suggest options, or at least I got two. So I'm going to find the one I want, and I'm going to click on it, and now he's saved. His PID shows up, so we know that he is legitimately in the archive. Well, they should notice that his name is not what was on the spreadsheet. The, right. On the spreadsheet, he was Ryan, and here he's J. Ryan, and that's a an issue that comes up all the time with Ryan's name. Yeah, yeah, and it's an issue that comes up with other people's name too. So that's why we ask you all to provide us with all the person information ahead of time so that we can make sure that your person is in the database. And if it turns out they're already in the database, like they did research with somebody else, we can alert you to that. We're also going to send you back a list of everybody's PID so that once we have put the people in the database or found them in the database, we will send you their PIDs so that you can always use the PID to help you locate the person. Make sure you have the right Juan Martinez. Is there a way to look at um, like the, like PIDs electronically to see like like as I'm doing this, oh, I don't know where my list of PIDs is that ILA gave me, can I look to see? all the Juan Martinez's that are in the system. You can. What, what I recommend that you do is open a second um, 
tab in your browser. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to show you guys, but I don't want you to follow along necessarily. So I'm just going to come into another <coughs> window, put in the Islandora QA site. Oh, look. And here in the search, so this solar search is very powerful. And look, there's persons. So persons is the magic word. That takes you to the database filled with all of the names of everybody who's in the archive. Mm. And there are pages and pages and pages of these names. Um, oh, no, we ended up with, how did we get uh, files in our? Those are also probably files that contain. They persons. contain the word persons. Yes. As you said. Very it's powerful it's search engine. Yes. Files, oh, look. You can, you can Beautiful pictures <laughs> of persons. <laughs> <laughs> so start at the front. <laughs> There's probably like 33 pages of people or more. Um, and I will say that, oh, here's the problem. I didn't actually click on the person's database. Your mouse pad is so sensitive, Ryan, that I'm having. I'm sorry if I'm making anybody nauseous looking at this <laughs> because I'm not used to such a sensitive mouse pad. So in the old Isla site, when Isla first started, um, there it wasn't very big. you know. And everything that got put into the site was something that we digitized in-house. And at that, at that point of time, <laughs> some large collections came in where people were only identified by first names. And they got entered into the person database by first names only. And we do not do that any longer. There are far too many people in the database now for us to enter someone on a first name basis only. And so if you have someone who only wants to be identified by their first name, please put their first name in the metadata, in the description field of your metadata for either the resource or the file that they participated in. Don't, because we're not going to add them to the database now. Huh. Um, May, that was a really good question. Thank you for asking that. And can we update yes. so can we update our personal information at any time? Um, you can update your. Can, for example, in one of the names, there, uh -huh. it was Jesus instead of Jesus. You need to. It, was that one of your? It, was, it, it wasn't the list. That right. You know, it might have been. I mean, is that? Do you know that person? I see that uh, Jesus, and I don't know. When it's that was entered, it. it's it's unlikely, but at this point, you unless somebody, right, I'm just not going to just go in and change it because there are some strange spellings of people's right. names that we get. <laughs> yeah, so I, I would, I feel uncomfortable Let's just going in and changing it. If it really was an error, we know that. If it was really an error and you know it, then you would write to me or Ryan but and ask us to fix it. If it's an error in your own name, you still have to write to us and get us to fix it because you don't have access to your own person record. Yeah, the person, the person database is linked. It's like its own collection. So as a self-depositor, you're given a special um, pass into your own collection. And the depositor role is a very powerful role. And in fact, this role is what delayed the launch of the archive for many, many months, was getting this role to work correctly, because it was way too powerful at first. The idea is that you have access to your own collection and nobody else's collection. And you have administrative access to certain things in your collection. But the person's collection, your own person record, is in the person's collection, and you don't have access to that. Does that help explain it? Yeah, but we'll be happy to change your person record if you want us to. Okay, so the next thing we have here is the depositor. Oh, this, I'm sorry, it goes so fast. The um, depositor might not always be the same person as the collector. And situations where this arises are frequently situations where the collector is now deceased and somebody else is acting as depositor on their behalf. Um, so go to your spreadsheet and look and see who we have listed as the depositor. And we're in luck. It's the same two people that oh, we yeah. had listed as the collector. So, whoops, sorry. We'll go back into the interface. And in the names field, we'll go through the same process that we did before where we are looking for Mark Sicoli by typing slowly into the auto-suggest field and then selecting his name when it appears. And then we click the Add button to get another tab to come up. We click in that second tab, put the cursor in the name, in the, field, uh, the uh, 
the um, text box and start to type. Uh oh. Sometimes you'll find that if you type too many characters, you don't get options. It's very finicky. Okay, so has everybody got their people listed, uh, entered into the um, form, the web form? Okay, next we're going to do the same thing with language. So go back to your spreadsheet and look to see what language is listed in this collection. And so this is blue on the spreadsheet, and notice that we have two languages here. We have not just the language name, but we've got the language code, and that's simply to help, um, help you identify what you're looking for or help us identify what we're looking for. So back on the website, put your cursor in the language box, start to type Chinon Tech. There's quite a few Chinon Tech choices. We want the Sochiapam. We select it. We click Add because we want to add a second language. We click on the second tab, put the cursor in the text field. And the next one was Chatino Tataltepec. Yell if I pass it. Ryan. Ah, it's at the bottom. That was lucky. Okay. Sorry. Pro tip, you might want to search over the least common oh, yeah. string in the thing you're looking right. for. Yeah, that'll make it come up a little faster, unless, you know, the least common thing is the Zapotec de San Juan, and then you've got, like, <laughs> San Juan's pretty common. <laughs> Funny enough, this time, this time it gives you the, it, it stores the name of the language, yes. and the last time it stores the ISO. That is not by design, language. that's by, that's right. by accident. Yeah, I yes. Guess. That's that's by, you know, developers getting their hands on stuff and not doing what you told them to do. Okay, the next field is the country field. So if we go back to the spreadsheet, we're going to look and see what countries are listed here. Mexico for sure, but also notice that the United States is listed. And this is because the country field is actually asking which countries all the materials in this collection were created in. And so we have a situation where some of the materials were actually created in Mexico. The audio and the video recordings were done in Mexico. Maybe some of the transcriptions were done in Mexico. But a lot of the analysis work, the analytical work, was done in the United States. And so both countries get listed as countries of collection. So start to type in Mexico. You guys are probably ahead of me now and click on the Add button to get a second tab. Click on the two, put your cursor in the box, start to type United States. Now, we, this is not an exhaustive list of all countries. Um, <laughs> we're only adding countries as we need to. So if, if you know, the, the country that you want is not in there, please write to us and let us know. Um, next is a description field. And, while, before I forget, and I'm sorry I didn't do this before, this form is really, really long because it is a bilingual form and there are instructions in both English and Spanish underneath every form field so that if you forget what we're doing here today, all you have to do is read the instructions and you'll remember exactly what to do. So back on the metadata spreadsheet, we come over to um, column P, which is the description. And we're just going to copy that right out of there. Yeah, there's two fields. There's one for English, one for Spanish, and then there will also be one for the indigenous language, which we can't see on but, the but screen. But in yet. the English, there's Spanish. Uh, that's because it noticed that it says these are bilingual instructions, right? So the no, name of the field in English is Description English, and the name of the field in Spanish is Descripción Inglés. Oh, yes, yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. It is kind of confusing when oh, you look oh, at it the first time. Blue, yeah, the um, metadata spreadsheet is also bilingual. And one of the um, parts of the self-deposit form that is not quite ready for distribution yet is 
that if you are a self-depositor at Isla, you will faithfully translate all of your metadata. If, it, if you collected it in Spanish, you faithfully translate it into English and vice versa. If you took your metadata down in English, you need to translate it into Spanish because otherwise it's invisible to somebody who's using the other side, right? So if you only put Spanish metadata in and an English user is looking at the site, they're not gonna see any of your metadata because it's only gonna show up in the Spanish view. Okay, the next field is description in indigenous language. And notice all this whole box is in white to indicate that the description field and the language field underneath it go together. Um, so just like we did for the title, you're going to be indicating the language that the description is in. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, I've got a pointer, okay. So th we've got that information in the spreadsheet, so just go over to the spreadsheet, copy it out, and once again, the language is Tataltepec Chitino. So after you copy the language, uh, the description into the description field, which is a free text box, you're going to use the auto-suggest field to come up with the language, and. We'll use Ryan's pro tip this time and just start to typing to Taltepec and look, it was the only one that came <laughs> up. So that's an excellent pro tip. <laughs> so we also have a reference field. So this reference field is for any references that to works that have come out of the materials in this collection. And people um, kind of expect us to keep up with their reference field for them, and I'm very sorry. We cannot stay on top of all of your publications and add them to the reference field for you. You're going to, if you want it to be in with your ILA collection, you're going to have to add it yourself. So we have only one reference for you to copy in here, but again, notice that you could include multiple. I've entered like 12 or 15 references in here for some, some of the collections that I've worked on. So once you've finished adding all of this information, click on this button here that says update, and you'll get the little message that says waiting for, for it to update. And your screen won't look exactly like my screen because my screen has my name on it, but you should have the same metadata here in the metadata card, or the catalog card, if you will. So that's how you edit your collection information. Do we have any questions at this point? I have a question, but it's related to, so I um, I have a name and a password and I go, I go into Isla. So I'm just, I'm only allowed to modify my data, right? So yes. In that sense, I'm, um, I can be an editor but, and also a, a, get, a guest to see all <coughs> any other files. Correct, right. So Isla, you are required to log into Isla in order to use the site, in order to stream video, audio, view files, right? The metadata, and I should have said this at the beginning, the metadata is open. So an anonymous internet user can land on the Isla page and read any of these catalog cards that we're looking at right here. They can search the site, they can find people in the person database, but they won't be able to stream any of the files or view any of the files until they create an account and agree to the, the conditions of use. So once they've done that, then they'll be able to download the files or view the files, whatever they want to do. But then you have special access into your collection. So if you go to somebody else's collection, it's like you are an authenticated, logged in user. But if you go to your own collection, that's when you will see these view and manage tabs, and that's when you'll be able to make changes. Yes, good. Okay, so going. Uh, Susan, I also have one question. Yeah. I noticed that some of these fields um, are things that are probably also, are, are, is metadata that's probably also relevant to the actual items within the collection, for example, like what country it's in. Yeah. If I add an item to the collection that I say is in Canada, is that automatically going to update the collection, or do I need to do that manually? You're going to have to do that manually. Okay. Yeah. That's another good question. And unfortunately, there's a lot still that's very manual in everything in the site. Um, this really is MVP, Minimal Viable Product. Uh-oh, I just closed my slides. Sorry. Let me open those back up. 
Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is add a resource. So we are on the collection page, and you can tell from the breadcrumbs here, it says home, collections, and then it has the name of my collection. And then underneath, in between the English title and the Spanish title, we've got these two buttons, view and manage. So again, click on manage, and then underneath, next to a little bullet point, it says add an object to this collection. Mm -hmm. So please click on that. All right, so now we have our metadata ca uh, card entry here at the top, and, but if we scroll down, we're going to see our form fields. And so now this one, rather than starting with the English title, it starts with the indigenous title. So we're going to go over to our metadata spreadsheet, and now we're going to switch tabs. So on the spreadsheet, click on the resources tab. And the very first column, column A, says title, indigenous, and there's nothing there. So we're not going to put anything in on the web form. The first title that we have here is in English, so go ahead and copy that out. And go back to your collection, to the resource that you're creating. And the one, two, third field here is English title, and copy the title in there. Then you're going to do the same thing with the Spanish title. Go back to your spreadsheet, get the Spanish title, or you can just translate it yourself if that's faster for you. So now that you're getting a feel for how these different fields work, I think that um, things might go a little bit faster, but please stop me if I am going too fast. Okay, so now we're going to enter contributors. So this field is, I'm going to see if I can shrink it just a little bit to get the whole thing on the screen. Let's see. Boy, I might need Ryan to come over here and do it for me. It's so sensitive. Um, <laughs> I can't quite get it all on the screen. Let's try shrinking it one more time. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the contributors in ILA, these are all the people who are involved in the research production. They played a role in that research production. Okay, so you're going, this tab refers to the person that you're adding, and this tab refers to the role that they played in the research. Now, notice this is a drop-down menu. This is the very first drop-down menu we've seen. So it's very important that you always check the role to make sure that you filled something in. Otherwise, everybody's going to show up as actor. So now if we go to the spreadsheet and we will find the first person we want to add is Mark Sicoli. That's no surprise since he was also the collector. But notice that he has two roles. So he was the, whoops, I'm pointing at myself, the researcher, and he's also listed as author here. And then the next person is um, Marcelina Flores Marescol, and he was the research participant, so he has only one role. So this is where things can get a little bit tricky in the form. So go back to the form, and is that big enough for everybody to see? So notice we have an auto-suggest for the first choice and a drop-down menu for the second choice. So we're going to start ty typing Sicoli's name into the auto-suggest field. And once we have it, we add it. And then we come down to the role that he played in the research. And we need to find researcher here in the list. Now notice that this list is alphabetical based on English, and it has the Spanish translation next to it. I apologize for anybody who's a native speaker of Spanish. This was the best we could do with the programmers that we had. <laughs> but um, so this forces us to choose both the English and the Spanish, both the English and the Spanish at the same time. So we add him as the researcher, and notice this add button goes with this field because it's all in the same box, and the add button underneath it 
is to add a new participant because it's all in the same box. Okay, so this is where it, boxes. nested boxes, right? This was some fancy programming, actually. It took a lot of special configuration, yeah, in Tony's words. Um, click on the add button to get a second roll. Click on two, and then come down and choose author because that was the second role that was listed on the spreadsheet. Okay, so now this notice that we have Mark and he's got two roles. Now keep your eye on these tabs right here. If I just hover over the tab, you'll see what is selected for tab one without having to click on tab one. And if I hover over tab two, the same thing happens even though we can also see down here. Okay, so now we're going to click on this lower add button because we still need to add a second contributor. So the second tab has appeared. We're going to click on the second tab. Do we have to push add for the second row or you don't have to do that? You just make it all the way. You have to push. Um, well, okay. That's a really good question. So notice, so we are in the second tab. We're about to enter Marcelino, mm -hmm. but there are two tabs here, two tabs automatically populated. We actually need to get rid of one of these tabs. So to get rid of one of those tabs, you have to click on that little X mm -hmm. in the second box. Yeah. yeah, so click on that little X and the second tab goes away. That's a very good point, yes. Because otherwise it would have saved whatever the default was in that second box, which it seems to be actor. It would have said he was the um, research participant and the actor. I can't actually remember what role he played. Now, um, Marcelino's last name and first name are very hard to come up with. But if you type on Mariscol, he should come up. So you have to be very creative in your searches on the auto-suggest. And there are days when I get very frustrated with the auto-suggest. Oh, but there he is. Yeah. <laughs> but he's there. Oh, there he is. Yeah. You got him? You can unplug something. No, I think there's one there. I just can't you see can't it. You can't see it? There's yeah. one below. Yeah. That's it. Okay, the next field that we're going to look at is the language field. Oh, I forgot to add a role for this guy. I did exactly what I told you not to do, which was I, d I wasn't careful to check what his role was. What did we say his role was? He's research participant. Research yeah. participant, thank you. By what? Research participant? Uh, is it the speaker or is it someone? It's the generic form that. You it, actually, I'm sorry that we chose that. Let's just put speaker here. I think let's everybody put speaker in if you didn't already. Research participant. I'm I'm working on a list of controlled vocabulary that I can post on the site so that you will actually see what everything means. But um, research participant is basically someone who participated in the research, and we don't have a better term to assign to them. But it, it's not the speaker. It might be the speaker, but I would choose know. speaker. You may not know uh, right. who he was. Yeah. Exactly, right. He was there, you know, he was so it participating like, like, in some like way. Someone who's sitting on the side and might have influenced the speaker's decisions. Right. Oh, we have a person. We have a person called. What was that one, Ryan? I can't remember right now. The person who sits on the side and says, "Um, interlocutor." Yes, that was the <laughs> definition of the person. Um, okay, languages. If we go back to the spreadsheet, the only language that's involved in this particular resource <laughs> is Sochi and China Tech. So add that in. Uh-oh, I misspelled it, so nothing auto-suggested. There we go. And <coughs> the materials in this collection, if we go to the, um, back to the spreadsheet, we see that some of these materials were created in Mexico and some of these were created in the United States. So that's in the countries down here at the bottom. Can I ask a question? That yeah. Be a stupid question. <laughs> No question is a stupid question. If this is a way of, of ingesting the data initially, then how will the relevant names and stuff be in the drop-down menus to begin with without it having... You, s you sent that to us ahead of time. But then isn't that... 
kind of like doing it twice? No, because the we're putting the people into the person database. Oh, All I we're see. doing is adding them to the person the database, database, and you're database, finding so. them in the person database. So all we need to do right. ahead of time is, is let Isla know these are the research people who yep. are new to the database, which mm -hmm. I want to work with. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly so what you need to do. Right. If they're already there, that's okay. You check it against the... Right. Check. We're going to check it against the master. So notice that we have a description field and in English and Spanish and, again, the indigenous language. And so we've already done these description fields, um, so I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to let you fill in the information, go to the spreadsheet, get the information, and put it into the spreadsheet. <clears throat> and raise your hand or speak up if you need help. why you might want to just say participant. If you have two, two men are participating in a, what is it called, a single blind map navigation task or something like mm -hmm. that, then it's not exactly somebody who's giving, a speaker giving you data about the language. And but that might be a good reason to use participant. To use research participant instead, for sure. Research yeah. participant. Yeah, there was one experiment that I did that involved um, location of things in relation to each other. <laughs> and there was no speaking going on at all in that experiment. So that would be a good example of Wendy's research participant. Um, so the, the spreadsheet that we're working with, mm -hmm. this is a model for us for like, as we're keeping track of our own files to make sure that we that we know all of this metadata ahead of time before we go. Exactly. Possibly ever going to be a way to take this standardized spreadsheet and use it to automatically up create that's our that's our hope and dream, yes. But is it going to happen in time <laughs> for you? <laughs> No promises, sorry. <laughs> it took us three and a half years just to get this repository launched. So, <laughs> Okay, so moving on back to the form. Um, I did not enter the description, so I'm... I have one final Oh, I'm sorry. Question. Yes. Is, there, is this metadata spreadsheet template going to be available somewhere, or do I need to, like... This one it is available. <laughs> it is, but it's not as pretty as this one. We just edited this one yesterday to make it really pretty. So you could guard this and just delete all the sample data out and use it if you want to. Okay. Um, this is the latest version and it hasn't even made it up on the website. But at some point, it's on the website with the the. I'm gonna um, actually. The colors aren't as pretty. They're kind of garish and clashing and then let me go to the actual Isla. Oh, it's not Phyla, it's Isla. <laughs> there should be a Phyla. Um, he, on <coughs> this website over here in depositor information and then you click on depositors, our forms are here. This is where you will eventually find the self-deposit form. We'll post it online. And this is also where you will download the metadata spreadsheet. But you'll get, like, the version before this if you download it right now, whereas, like, next week you could probably get this version. <laughs> it just hasn't gotten up there now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So if you follow that link at a later date. Um, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. So here's a field called language community. And this is kind of a vague field, but this is the location where the subject language is spoken. And this is really important when there are different, um, either different ISO codes for what seems like the same language or the same ISO code for what are clearly different languages. And, and a good example of this is the case of Ishiel. Danny's not here, but there's like three major varieties or dialects of Ishiel. Um, but there's only one ISO code for Ishiel, so you can put down one of the language communities, whatever language community the this particular um, video or what have you is relevant to. That goes into the language community field. And the language community field might not make any difference to, to the you or the language you work on. Whereas in other situations, it is hugely important to add that information in here. So only you know if that information is important to your research context. I can't tell you if it is or not unless you give me a whole lot of information. Just because uh, 
Uh, just a point of information on the ISO codes. <coughs> the ISO codes, ISO codes for Mayan languages used to have multiple names for the different languages, but they called them languages, not dialects, which they were not, and they weren't correct anyway. They didn't have a full list. And so I was the one that, um, <coughs> that reformed that. And so yes, now there are, they're only using a single designation for each language, which means that if you want to distinguish the dialects, you have to do it in some other way. Yeah. So it's, but, w it w but the point being that somebody who has a fair amount of authority can make the, that reform happen. Hmm. And then, SIO will and the fight with you about it. they will fight with you about it. Um, I, I haven't done it, so I can't. I don't have anything to add other than thank you, because the people who need to make the who need to fight the battles are the people who work on those languages. Like nobody else is going to fight that battle <laughs> except you. So if you're complaining about the ISO codes not being specific enough or too specific, then you, as the researcher of that language, it's your job to do something about it. Right? You're the expert. So um, the next field source note is important if you have changed a file name. So you know when you go into the field and you've got your video camera or your regular image camera or even your audio recorder, they automatically assign file names. Um, and it might just be a numeric um, file name. And I don't know, it, does anybody in here actually track what the original file names were or do they? Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're after my own heart. So if you have kept a list of what those original file names were, because that's your raw, the rawest form of your data, but then you later change that name to include, you know, whatever code you're using for your file names, be that somebody's initials, community, language, date, whatever, you've got your system. Um, if you have tracked that information, this is the place where you will put it. So this is essentially the original file name. Now, for material that was originally analog, this would be a place where I could write, you know, notebook one of 10 or something like that. Um, or cassette one of 25 from blank series. I mean, there's all kinds of information that can go here, but this is another one of those fields that's it's very personal and only you are going to know if you have the information to go there or not. Susan, when you migrated to this um, <coughs> new, whole new ILA site, did you keep the same mm -hmm. codes for all of the, each of the files? Mm -hmm. Yep, all the file names are still there, yeah. We didn't change anything. Um, the, pl the place created, um, believe it or not, the actual place created might not be the same as the language community. Okay, so say you are working with the uh, group that's in the diaspora. So say you're working with the Mixtec speaker who is from somewhere in Oaxaca, but you happen to be doing field work in California with them, right? But they are speaking a variety of Mixtec that has a specific language community name. So that information goes in language community but the fact that you're working in um, Santa Barbara, California, goes in this field right here. So this is the place where the original recording was created. I think more people are working on this tech in California than there. And then in Mexico, yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Sorry, can I clarify something about the source yeah. note before you move on? Um, yes. Is that, am I understanding correctly that that's kind of specifically like for my, as a researcher's purposes, so that when I'm going back to my own files, yes. that I have a hard copy on an SD card or whatever, I know where to look for. Yes, it. exactly. Because there will come a time where you've got so many files and you're like, I can't remember if I put this in the archive. And if all you have left is a record of what that original file name was, then this is a way for you to figure out if you put that file into the archive or not. Yep. Thank you for your questions. Okay, the date created field is in the international standard, four numbers for the year, two numbers for the month, two numbers for the day. Okay, so it goes year, month, day. Um, if you only know part of the date, so you didn't write down, say, the day, but you have the year and the month, I recommend using X's for any part of the date that you do not have. Um, if you only have the year, put the year. It's pretty obvious that that's the year, but if you put the year and only the day, believe it or not, some people only know the year and the day. <laughs> um, <laughs> or if you only know the year and the month, then it can get ambiguous about whether you've entered the month or the day, right? So 
that's when the X's would be useful. Um, if we go to the spreadsheet, we can actually get a date. Here we go. Now, this date created is going to be the date created for the earliest file that you're going to put into that resource. And that, oops, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how I did that. But. <coughs> Oh, I accidentally opened another window. Um, so this is going to be the first date. Typically, the first date of a file in the resource is the date that that primary recording or that first recording was made. Okay. Um, next field is genre. And notice that the genre is another one of these that has an add button. So you can choose as many genres, as many relevant genres as you think are appropriate for the material that you have. So if we go to the spreadsheet, notice that we have three genres saved here. Um, and I will add that even though we have only three different columns for genres, you can copy that and you know have as many columns as you want. You could have 25 genre in here if you thought it was relevant to 25 different things. Um, you'll have to enter all 25 things into the web form, but you can have multiple genres here. So in this field, we have conversation, instructions, and whistled speech. So we're going to go back over <clears throat> to the archive and select conversation. Oops, I did not get conversation, so be careful when you select things. Click the Add button. You'll get your second tab. Click on that. Grab your next one, which was instructions. Ah, it's too too fast. It could be a procedure, right? Okay. Instructions. Uh, you could just write down instruction in that drop down box and just go into it. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, you're trying to hurry me along. <laughs> there, are you happy? <laughs> for, um, for the genres. Yes. Uh, are they fixed the way they are? Are you going to add more? Or? We're not going to add any more if we can help it. Okay. Um, that's a controlled vocabulary. And so I anytime that we add a new term to our controlled vocabulary yeah. list, there's all those hundreds of thousands of yeah. files that didn't have the option of had having that term yeah. added. We do do it in cases of dire emergency. For example, map was not one of the genre terms in the original database, and we had all these maps and no way to find them. And so I added map to the database, but then I also had to go through and search for all the maps that we had. I don't know that I found them all, but yeah, so that's why we don't add genre. Um, okay, so finally we're going to add a reference, and we have one reference here. And again, this is a field that you could put multiple references in. And for the sake of time, we're just putting one. And once you have your reference in, there's a little tiny button at the bottom left that says ingest. Did everybody mm -hmm. find the ingest button? Click on ingest. And the repository will eat it. Yum, yum, yep. Yum. Double, double. And it, now it should say yum yum. It used to say please be patient while the the. <laughs> okay. Ooh, what did I do? Yikes. Okay. So. Language code is required. I got rejected. Did you not put a language code in? Wow. So that's new. So. Apparently, if you don't put a language in, the form will not ingest. Uh oh, Ryan. Technical difficulties. So this is what I did, and it said language code not specified. Did you type it in, or did you put it in the? I'll let you play with it, and you can hit ingest and see what it does. Oh, 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 there. Well, is it, is it, oh, yeah, is right. it also okay. the translate? It's, it's maybe the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what happened, Ryan? If the uh, indigenous title or description field is not empty, a language code has to be specified. So it, it doesn't oh, okay. tell you where, where you exactly went wrong. It, no. Uh, 
it's not a perfect system. Okay, so I, I want to draw everyone's attention to the six-digit number right up here. That is your persistent <laughs> identifier. And we have a place on, on the spreadsheet, the very last column in the resources tab of the spreadsheet is a place where you should record the PIDs. And this is a housekeeping ta uh, task that is going to feel very onerous, but it's really something that's crucial because many people keep the same metadata spreadsheet throughout their all of their field trips. And later, they give us the same spreadsheet or they have to consult the same spreadsheet and they've forgotten what they put in the archive and what they didn't. But as long as you're keeping track of your PIDs, this is the this is the place to put your PID, keep track of it, and you automatically know if it's in the archive or not. If you have a PID in that column, you know that that file or that resource is in the archive. Because it wouldn't have been generated by the file. Exactly. Is PID generated for every single uh, document? Yep. We're going to get one for every single document. Yes. So again, that number right there, is a very important number and I recommend that everyone keep it. It can also, if you put that um, six digit number into the solar search, it'll take you right to that record. It's the quickest way to get to a particular record. All right, so all we did so far, we created, we edited our collection material and we added a resource to that collection. And so now you can see on our breadcrumbs, here's our resource, here's our collection, it's inside the collections database that's inside Isla. I wish it said Isla instead of home, but it says home. Can't have it all. All right, so now it's time to add a um, media file. And I'm going to talk a little bit about media files and the types of media files that uh, we can add. I'm sorry, I'm, I wasn't keeping up here. Um, so we're... As I mentioned before and as, I allude, as Ryan alluded to earlier, we only allow certain media types. We're going to show you what those are. You need to check your file sizes. Make sure that they're all approximately a gigabyte or smaller. And if they're not, you're going to have to compress and or cut your files down. And by cut, I don't necessarily mean eliminate. I mean break them into multiple parts. Okay, So you might have like one really long video that you break down into parts one, two, three, and four. Make sure that you don't have any viruses in any of your folders, please. I mean, it seems kind of obvious, but please be careful that you're not um, uploading any executable files or anything like that when you ingest files into the archive. So it's a good idea to just go ahead and run your virus <laughs> software before you actually start ingesting. And avoid special characters in the file names. Um, the special characters that are especially problematic are spaces, colons, and periods anywhere other than setting off the file extension. So um, it used to be quite common before like this decade for people to put periods in instead of dashes or underscores to separate parts of the file name. Please don't do that. Um, that will completely stop ingestion of the file. Um, colons are also really problematic for any kind of processes that have to run behind the scenes. Spaces, though not immediately problematic for what you're doing here, can be problematic for other behind the scenes things that happen okay. that you won't be doing but that we will be doing behind the scenes. Question, so are hyphens and underscores legal? Yeah. Good. Yes, they're legal. Pardon? Use yeah, right. right. Use those instead of spaces. Now these are, uh, Isla has, allows essentially six content models. So I'm going to say that again. Isla allows six content models and this is a crucial step. When we go to add a media file, we have to pick the content model that we're of the form in order to get the correct form because each different content model has different types of metadata. So, you know, the metadata that you have about your audio file is different from the metadata that you have about your video files, your binary files, your images, and your PDFs. Um, large images, TIFFs, and, uh, well, TIFF and TIFF, 
are limited to single page items. So you won't want to upload multiple page TIFFs if you even have those. Um, because they won't display properly. They'll, only the first page will display. Hmm. Um, PDFs, we ask you very kindly from the goodness of your heart to make that PDF a PDF A. This is going to require access to Adobe Acrobat Pro to create a PDF A. If you don't know how to do it, get in touch with myself or Ryan and we can walk you through the, but all of your lab, um, any computer lab here on campus that has Acrobat is going to have Acrobat Pro and that's what you use to make a PDFA. Um, there's probably yeah. online converters to do it too. I don't so use any of those. Where, when you call up a PDF where it says it has options, and if you open that up, it'll have PDF, PDFA, and other kinds of things, and you just choose PDFA. Okay, so unchoose it on your next file if you don't want to continue to use it. Oh, I have a different process for doing it, so um, go ahead, Tony. <coughs> so Microsoft Word, <coughs> on the Mac at least, from a fairly old age, does PDFAs. You'll have to tell us how to do that because I don't know how to do it on the no. Mac to create a PDFA. Yeah, you just pull down the PDF thing in the print and you go way down to the bottom of the mm -hmm. menu and it says Adobe Format. So you can in Adobe Format. Oh, PDFA. okay. So if you have a Mac, you can do it for free. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I think that with, with what Word. I was talking about is you can do it from a Word on a, not a Mac. Is the way to do it. Yes, yeah. on the word. So it says PDF A dash 1B colon 2005 CMYK, whatever that is. <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> yep, but that's the one we want. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is add a media file to the resource. So now we know what kind of media files we're allowed to add. Um, before we do that, let's go back to the spreadsheet and change our tab to media files. And we, if we're lucky, we'll get through two. I'm going to have to move a little bit faster now that we're a little more familiar with the interface. Nora? Just one more small point about the PDF business. If you convert to a PDF, you cannot then subsequently convert to a PDFA. It won't work properly. So yeah, you so you to need to do it the first time around. From the original document. Yeah. yeah. Windows does also have PDFAs. Okay, also thank you. That's good to know. That's new. So now we don't have to have access to Acrobat. Okay, so we're going to um, ingest an audio file. So notice here um, on the spreadsheet, we're in column. Column A says your name. You're going to type that in. We'll get to that in a second. And column B is a file that's got dot .wave at the very end. So that's what we're going to be working with. So let's go back over to the um, to Isla and Again, we are in the resource inside the collection that we, that well, our collection, and we're going to click on manage and then add an object. Add an object to this resource. Is it doing it? Yep. So it looks like nothing happened, but it did. If you scroll down, here you see at the very bottom the content model to ingest. Island Dora is the name of the software that we are using. I begged them to take that out, and they would not take that out. So Island Dora is, doesn't mean anything, except that's the name of the program. But notice the next part is what you're going to be looking for. So you want to find the audio content model. How did we get there? I, I can't really did you figure out how, how we got there. Did you click on Manage? So I'll go back. Yeah. Yep. So manage, and then but underneath manage, that, there's a stuff. add. So you have to go. You have to so I manage, hit manage. Be at from the resource. You're currently at the collection. Uh, yeah. Everybody, so make sure you're at the resource level, so and it says so map navigation yeah, pilot. Then all the resources you Is everybody else there? Okay. And oh, that's uh, so. I click on this. Yes. You're good. I am. Yeah. Okay. I don't see now. the thing. Then no. I go manage. Oh, it's hi it's higher up. Oh. Yeah. No. Where? Hi, right there. Map right. navigation. But bio. now the thing yeah. for adding the audio thing? What browser are you in? Oh, that's at the bottom. What? Right, yeah. but it's not there. Is it yes. Did you click? Oh, what browser are you using? Do we want to say add Firefox? Firefox? Yeah. Oh, maybe I didn't click that. that oh, did you click on okay. add oh. object to this? <laughs> Go back okay. up. Yeah, it's the same thing. We both did, did the same it. thing. Yeah. 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 Cool. Good. All right. All right. Let's see. Whoa. Ah. 
Stacy. Sorry. How are you guys over there? Of course, got it. All yeah. It's the majority. It's the. Right, we're older people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't get this. I can't use the, the trackpad. Okay, does everybody have audio content model selected? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and you have to click next. So choose audio content model, click next. And again, we will have a catalog card, our metadata card, and underneath that is the form. And the very first thing you need to do is enter by, so if you would, just type your name. You'll only have to do it once because your browser will probably remember it forevermore. You'll just have to start to type your name. So this is entered by, because we want to know who's actually doing the data entry. So if you are you know, a, a professor or a researcher who has other students working, students or other people working for you, you would want them to type their name here, not your name. Okay, so it's actually the person who did the data entry. Their name goes there. Um, then we're going to list the media languages. So a media language is every single language that is heard or written in that document. Okay, so if we go over to our spreadsheet and see how many media languages, ah, how did I get this extra spreadsheet here? I keep doing that. I'm old, that's why. Um, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, so notice that we have three media languages. We've got Chinantec, Spanish, and English. And I'm going to tell you right now, Spanish is going to be problematic to get it to show up in the language menu, and you're going to laugh when we get to it. But first, go back to Isla and put in Chinantec or Sochiapan. and click add, click on the tab two. Now Spanish, if you try to type Spanish, it's not gonna find it. You have to do Espanol, and this is a relic from the oh, old, from old Isla, old Isla right. yes, that we have not been able to figure out how to change, <laughs> so funny. I know. If you go to the language record for that language, it says Spanish, it says Espanol, it's, it's all clearly there, but for some reason it's just grabbing that language name that got migrated. And so other people who, if you're working on a language that you know has had material in Isla for a very long time, you might have the same problem with another language. So you just have to try different variations of that language. Okay. And notes to this effect? Because how are people going to ever know if they're not... Well, we're hoping that this will get fixed. Uh, um, yeah, and also... That's also by the instructions that we will return to the repositories after they give us a be, here's this bit, this is the name that you're looking for. So you'll know, you know, I know that you, you call the language Sumu, but you're going to have to type in Miami. Right, exactly, yeah. Okay, so um, again, get your date created, copy it in, because that's the next field. This date created happens to be the same as, oops, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong place, as the date created that we put on the resource form, because this is the first recording. This was the, this is kind of like the root item. Uh-oh, what did I do? I'm sorry, I went too far. If you hit enter, it'll just take you forward a, a screen and you won't really get past there. Um, we have a space here for some sort of physical description or technical description. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped content type. This is another controlled vocabulary that Isla has. And audio and video recordings are typically considered to be the primary text. So whatever the main media file or files in that resource might be, that's the primary text. And other things are frequently some sort of derivative product. So if you look at the choices that we have here, there are annotation, commentary, context, guide, <laughs> illustration, interlinearization, interpretation, photo, that's 
not quite a that that's not um, analysis, but uh, sample transcription, transcription translation, or just translation. So for an audio or video, you're typically going to choose primary text. There will be instances where maybe you don't, but those are instances where you write to us and ask us, what should I put here? Um, we have a description in our metadata spreadsheet in English and in Spanish, and you can copy those in while I talk. Um, you know how to use those fields now, but you'll notice that at this point we do not have an indigenous description here. So we're not I, I don't know why, it just didn't happen. <laughs> it just didn't make it into the form. And so we don't have a technical indigenous description. But we do have a field for length or duration. So if we're talking about pages, it's a length. If we're talking about recordings, it's a duration. For the recordings, we're going to ask that you use the format two numbers for the hour, colon, two numbers for the minutes, colon, two numbers for the second. So hour, hour, minute, minute, second, second, divided by colons for consistency across the database. And that information is in the spreadsheet. So you can just copy it right in. We were very nice and put it in the correct format in the spreadsheet. Then the next field is encoding specifications, and this field is unique to audio recordings. And the default is 22 slash 44.1 mono. Um, if you go over to the spreadsheet, you'll see that this recording was actually in stereo. The other numbers are the same, so you'll just have to, um, oops, sorry about that. I keep going to the wrong place. Yeah, it's right there. Select the stereo option. The platform field, this is a free text field because this is where you can put any kind of information relevant to the programs or the computers or maybe even the recording equipment. The instructions don't say recording equipment, but you could always put down the name of your camera here. If you did any kind of editing to your audio file before giving it to the archive, for example, you did it in Audacity, you would want to note that here. Um, any other kind of special formats that you were using, you would put that in the platform field. And the original medium was, um, in this case, it's a digital audio file. Notice that we have other sorts of original medium here for audio. If you had somebody digitize some old tape recordings that you had, the original format is tape, right? It's cassette tape. And so that would get chosen here. Probably um, nobody in this room, you know, besides Tony and Nora and myself, have tapes. But um, if, if you did, like if you go to the field and somebody gives you a tape from a long time ago and you decide you want to digitize that and put it in the archive, first get their permission. And then second, cassette tape goes in here. Um, and this field, I hate this field more than anything in the archive. This is a relic from back in the days when we had to digitize everything ourselves, And so things came to us in various forms of um, repair or disrepair, like moldy tapes or, you know, terrible recordings. But this is a place where you can kind of very um, subjectively decide if your recording is good or bad. <laughs> and the, the reason you would give it a bad um, number here, and I think that the one is really bad and five is really great. Um, if, for example, you were recording in a room that had a tin roof and it was a terrible rainstorm, but it was your only opportunity to record this very important ceremony, that's a kind of a bad recording because it's a rainstorm and a tin roof and you probably didn't get very good audio um, unless you had everybody mic'd like right here. but. So there, there is a circumstance in which you might want to use a one. If you have the best recording equipment in the world, you're probably going to put everything a five, but the default is three, and so almost everything I enter, I put a three. So please click the Next button. And if you haven't already opened up the um, sample data that we gave you, this Map Navigation Pilot sample data, please open that now. 
and locate the Sochiapam 4 dot wave file. Your computer might not say dot wave, but along um, one of the other columns might say that it's a wave yeah, file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And once you've located that, okay, now you know where it is, go back to the archive, click on Choose File. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And now you have to navigate to where that, Ryan, I have no idea where that folder is on your hard <laughs> drive. <laughs> and then you get Ryan to help you find the folder. <laughs> where did you say Choose File? Oh, yours says browse. Uh -huh. Oh, mine said choose file. Oh, that's hmm. because mine is a Mac and mine yeah. browses. Yours browses. You're, browse. you're using Firefox and we're using yeah. Chrome, and so there's a difference. Oh, okay. That, that cool. also helpfully explains why I have never been able to find the place where I can translate that button. Oh, because it says browse. Oh, no, it's the browser. Go. It's up to the browser. Oh, the browse mm -hmm. button. Okay, so Ryan found the file for me, oh, yeah. and now I'm going to click on the upload button. So you can see that he successfully chose a file because the file name is there and now it's time to click upload and things might slow down here as we all try yeah, to upload a file <laughs> but I was the first files. one yeah and you know it was successful if you get a button that says remove if remove replaces upload does anybody have something besides remove there Tony I'm curious to see what you get yours says remove okay Okay, so here's where it tells you the allowed file types. I should have pointed this out to you before so we hit upload. Yeah. Yep, Waver MP3. But notice that it basically says you can upload a two gigabyte file, and that is not right. Because there's a lot of processes that are going on in the back end every time we upload a file. And we've got so much metadata in here that it just slows all the processes down. And so we can really, but we haven't figured out a place where we can change this information. So I'm telling you, it says two gig, but it's actually closer to one gig. And now click ingest. 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 Uh, does anybody's button say something besides ingest? I haven't got it. Now we're upload. I don't worried know about. Did you click upload? Up the same. Yes, but it and then I don't know. I changed the file name because it wasn't uploading, so oh, I thought no. that was it. But no, that doesn't seem to be. What happened? Uh, Did we get an error? Let's keep an yeah, write down, if you successfully ingested your file, grab your six-digit oh, PID. Good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. This is just yeah. one, two, three. Mine is seven digits. Mine is um, one, two, three, four, yes. five, six, seven, eight digits. Well, start after the A. Oh, oh, oh. Right. <laughs> because that, that, um, a, uh, that percent sign 3A translates into colon. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so, so transparent, isn't it? So, right. <laughs> I'll always remember that. 3A. 3A, yeah. So, I can't, so can I put 3A in a file name and in that way trick it? Trick so it, maybe. You want to be the first to try? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so now... Now that you've grabbed your six-digit PID, copy that into your spreadsheet so that you have it for later. And it's almost time for us to go. So we are going to skip ahead to setting access levels. So we've created a file. Now here's the one place where the breadcrumbs don't work right. So after we've initially created a file, the breadcrumbs seem all wonky. And so the way that I've found to fix that is to click on view and that kind of refreshes the screen. It forces the um, solar search engine re-indexing to happen <laughs> and the breadcrumbs look like we expect them to look now. Okay, so we're going to set the access levels on this one file. To do that, just like we've done every single time so far, you click on Manage. And after you click on Manage, you're going to click on Access Levels. Right up here, Access Levels. 
and nothing's happened for me. Yeah, something happened. It looks like nothing happened, but something really did it, happen. It, yeah. There's a button. Somewhere. Right. So down here. So let me go back to our slides and talk a little bit about access levels. Um, there is a chart in the slides about access levels. Isla's access levels have always been four levels, one, two, three, and four. One is public access. Two, three, and four is restricted access. Let me guess Level zero, two, one, two three. yes. <laughs> and so on the back end, it's zero, one, two, three. It takes a little while to get used to, but fortunately, some sort of explanation also appears on the back end. So if we go back into the archive, you will see here, so authenticated access means somebody has to be logged in to view or download the file. Level one, that's the equivalent to ILA's level two, password protected. We only use this now for administrative curation and progress. If you have files that can never be public access files, please do not put them in the archive, okay? I'll say that again. If you have files that should never be public access, do not put them in the archive. So what never do we mean? Suppose in 25 years it'll be fine. In 25 years, then we've got an option for that. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. so okay. that is a time limit, okay? Oh, okay. Yes. And then we also have this contact depositor. We're going to click first on time limit so that you see what happens when we're going to say there's going to be a time limit. So. What? Why? Because okay. this doesn't there's work there's in Internet Explorer. There's a, there's a, there's does it still exist? Yeah. Really? I don't know about that. Regard. That we discovered two days ago. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to enter just one, two, three, four, five for my password. And then you can enter an optional hint. Oops, I didn't put five. You can enter an optional hint if you want. and But remember that if you put a hint, somebody might try to solve the riddle oh, right. and figure out what the password is, right? So only do that if it's uh, if it's something that you don't really care about. Um, somebody's going to try to do it. That's all there is to it. We have justifications for restricting the access, and we have some pre-programmed justifications. Um, it's a protected population. It's required by the IRB. So these two are kind of reserved for um, older collections in Isla. When Isla first started, we took everything we could possibly get, and a lot of what we got had been collected during a time period before people were really getting documented, informed consent. Okay, and so they, the researchers who were putting their materials from the 60s, 70s, even the 80s into the archive, were uncomfortable making those materials public access because they just didn't know what the speech community might think about it. I mean, the internet didn't even exist then, right? <laughs> so we have some um, kind of pre-programmed things that probably will not apply to you since I've just said, if your files can never be public, don't put them in the archive. But if you need to protect them for a little while, you know, at some point, these children are going to be 18, so maybe you are releasing the files after they're at 18 with their permission. Um, maybe the IRB has required you to um, <laughs> restrict access for a certain amount of time, or the speech community has required it. Now, speech community requirements are something that we are willing to negotiate with. So if the speech community wants the files in the archive and they intend to use the files, but they don't want anybody else to get to them, that's something different. We can have a conversation about that. But if it's just you not wanting to share your data with anybody or you didn't bother to get informed consent, don't put that in the archive. Um, the wish of the speaker, the speaker's family, ceremonial, ritual, or esoteric language, a thesis in progress, material that's under copyright. Yes, we do have some copyrighted material in the archive. Um, what we do is we look up when the copyright will expire and we put that date in. Um, could not obtain informed consent, administrative curation and progress, and other reasons. So if you choose other reason, a box is going to show up and you have to fill out that box. So now you have to write your explanation for, um, for your justification. And we're going to set a time limit. So let's set this to um, release tomorrow. <laughs> but if you notice that this little box, when you pull it up, 
the years only go to 2020, but you can you, you can don't write anything you can write anything you want, and you you are not restricted to the years that are on this box. Huh. Um, notice the archival format for the year. If you don't get, I mean, for the whole date, if you don't get it right, and say this was set to release on 10 um, six then the computer, if you put 610, then the computer w would release it on June 10th. I don't know that you know four months is gonna make that much of a difference, but just be aware that this is archival um, format. So once you have everything entered, you click Commit Changes. And I forgot to show you what this looked like before, but click on View, and scroll, whoops, that didn't work. Sorry, go back to, um, Map Navigation Pilot, so we're using the breadcrumbs to go back to the resource to get to the file list for the resource. Oops. So we've got one file in this resource and it is restricted at access level three. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's say, oops, we didn't mean to do access level three, let's change it to access level four so we see what that looks like. So click on Manage and then Access Levels. And, oops, sorry, I'm assuming something happened. And it did, so I come down here and, okay, level four contact depositor is level three contact depositor on the back end. You're gonna have to add your password again. Passwords are encrypted and there's no way to recover them other than to simply change them. So enter your password, choose your justification, and here you can put your, your own name if you want people to contact you to get access to the material or if there's some representative from the community who wants to be the gatekeeper for these materials, you can put their name in as long as they have an email address and they are willing to check their email and um, answer their email and especially when they get email from people that they don't know asking permission to access particular files, they have to be prepared to either say yes or no, write back politely and explain if why or why not somebody can or cannot have access. So I'm just gonna put in Susan and I'm gonna put in Isla and commit changes. <clears throat> and down here at the very bottom, there's my same file and there's the new access level. So access levels can also be changed at the resource level. So we can change them at the file level or the resource level. And if you've only got one file, just do it at the file level. But if you've got a resource of like 20 files or more that you want to change, then it's useful to know how to do it at the resource level. But, okay, so click on view. We're back at the resource. And we can do the same thing. It's always manage no matter where you are in the archive and then access levels. And notice here we have a list of the files that are in this resource. Right now we've only got one file. <laughs> but imagine that we had 10 and we wanted like five of them to be one access level and the other five to be another access level. We could do that here by checking the ones that we wanted to have a certain access level setting that access level, committing the changes, and then going in, select the other five, set the access level, commit those changes. Or maybe you do a global set for all 10 and then choose your five that you want a different access level for. There's, I mean, you can get creative and there's no one right way or wrong way to do it. You can also change your access levels at the collection level. So click on view and once you click on view, you can see the proper breadcrumbs again. Click on your collection name. And again, click on manage and access levels. Now here, you will not be able to select your files. If you change your access levels at the collection level, it will be a global change across every single file in that collection. This is a good way um, if you, so let's imagine a scenario where you're still a graduate student, you've put your material in the archive and you don't want anybody to start using it and downloading it until you finished your dissertation. So you set a time embargo, say five years from now, 
and everything's going to revert to public access. But say you finish in three years and not five years, and you say, okay, I want to open everything up now. This is a really good way to open everything up all at once, to go into the collection level and set the pass, uh, re remove the password so you would set it to level zero. And we can do that here, and it'll apply to the one file. <laughs> so when we select level zero, notice everything that was underneath goes away, because there's no other choices to be made except commit the changes. And so now we have made that one file that was in that one resource in that collection public access again. Okay, any questions? Because at this point we've gone five minutes over time and I want to respect your time and it's Friday and um, we have some closing remarks if there aren't any questions that I do want to get to and that is this. As you can see, this is a laborious process. It's a laborious process for whoever does it. Whether it's you or it's an archivist or it's your research assistant, it's gonna be a laborious process. And that's why it's really, really important for you as you collect your material to vet your material as you go to decide what you're gonna put in an archive, in the archive. So even if you're putting every single file you created in the spreadsheet, which you can do, you might want to add a column to the spreadsheet that indicates whether you want to put it in ILA or not. Mm -hmm. And so you might have a spreadsheet that includes materials that somebody has said, yes, you can use that for analysis. No, don't you ever put that in the archive. Then mark that on your spreadsheet. It can live on your spreadsheet. It can live in the same folder with everything else, but you're not going to put that file into the archive. So what we're trying to get you to understand is that you have to curate your collection. And one of the problems with the digital age right now is that it is a digital deluge. We are living in a situation where we are collecting far more than we can ever analyze. I was collecting in a day when I took, you know, five boxes of 10 cassettes each into the field with me and that's what I had to record on and that was it. And even with that limited availability, I have more files, more audio than I could ever transcribe. So if you are recording all day long digital files, you come out of the field with literally hundreds if not thousands of files, you don't have to put all that in the archive.